that babies are capable of a wide range of feelings may come as no surprise to parents. But only recently has science turned its attention to the emotional lives of children. And in the past few years, new techniques have emerged that open a window onto infant emotions and which allow scientists to probe the nature of the child's inner world. Evidence is growing that emotions serve important biological and social functions in the development of a child's personality. But will this new understanding change the way we raise our children? Tonight on NOVA, join psychologist Tom Cottle as we embark on a quest to understand life's first feelings. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. When a mother greets a newborn child, the joy fills her face. Yet before long, the reality sets in that parenting can also be a confusing and difficult experience. I've been a house mother all summer long, and it's kind of neat because I get to see all this stuff every day. And he does it. You're not allowed to play with the TV, no. You can't stand up on the chair, you can't stand up on the table, you don't hit the chandelier, you don't dump the sugar bowl, you don't play with the lights on the Betamax, you don't turn the radio on and off, uh, you don't play in the toilet, uh, you don't get your dirty diapers out of your diaper pit. He would not go to nobody but me. So I had to start working and everything, because I used to leave and he used to throw tantrums. And when nobody else would want to keep him. I actually found her cringing in her crib when her older brother will go in and he'll push her down when she stands up in it. And... Uh -huh. My husband has no concept of parent burnout because he's burning out at work and I'm at home going, oh. When parents meet, they inevitably find themselves sharing questions about the emotional difficulties of parenting. They are concerned with how to do their best at what probably is the most important challenge they'll ever face, raising happy, healthy children. Can science contribute to this quest? I'm Dr. Tom Cottle. In the past 15 years, there's been an explosion of interest in the emotional development of children. This represents an enormous change, for historically, the field of psychology has viewed children in very limited ways. They've been described as a cauldron of seething drives, as a blank slate to be written on by the environment, and even as unfeeling learning machines. Some schools of thought have regarded the behavior of young children as simply a mechanistic reaction to rewards and punishments. Overall, most 20th century psychologists consider childhood emotion outside the pale of science and unworthy of serious study. Now, the climate has changed. Today, most researchers believe that the child brings into the world a rich tapestry of emotional potential. The study of the interplay between this inner world and the outer forces of the environment makes a fascinating story, one which may just help parents with their job and which can enrich our understanding of the very young. A newborn is bombarded with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches. 
One of the infant's first jobs is to develop a way of handling all these new experiences. He's looking at her, but he's much Professor dull. Edward Tronick of the University of Massachusetts began his work in the early 1970s. The emphasis in child psychology then was on how children learn. But his early studies suggested a dramatic new direction. When I first started working on this, I was um, working at an infant daycare center. And I felt like, gee, you know, I'm a real hot shot at this, so I'm going to do this kind of curriculum for these kids, and these kids are going to be really smart. And then as soon as I got there, I saw six or seven infants out there being played with by different caretakers. And each of the teachers had to find a different rhythm, if you will, in themselves to fit to the different babies. Tronic believes that emotions come first. If a baby fusses all the time, it can't begin to learn about the world. It's the emotional dialogue between parent and child which enables the infant to begin to control its emotions and at the same time lets the parents know how much stimulation the baby can handle. What she's doing is she comes in really close. And so there's all this stimulation now coming from the outside. Now, in a way, that gets his attention. But at the same time, again, he has to be able to, to deal with that. So what he starts to do, he decreases the stimulation. He looks away, helps to get himself back under control. And then he can come back and now re-engage with the mother. She does that hand movement. She smiles. He says, oh, I need a little break again. So he disengages. And then he smiles, and she comes back in, so that they're really in sync with one another. But if they do get out of sync, he knows that if he then smiles, that she'll come back. And what you're seeing is almost a perfect dance uh, between them. After studying hundreds of infants and mothers, Tronic became convinced that this dance between parent and child is characteristic of most normal interactions. He believes this wordless dialogue initiates a bond of mutual expectation and trust. But what happens if that bond of expectations is interrupted? And the procedure that we thought about was to ask the mothers to not respond to what the infants were doing. He looks at her. He smiles. Big, full smile. Realizes right there that She's not doing what he expects. So what he does now is something we saw him doing in the normal intro. He looks away. He disengages. He's saying, something's wrong. I'm getting a little upset. This isn't exactly right. So I'll look over here. Right now, he's saying, this doesn't feel real good. And I'm going to try again. And looking at my hands is a way. I'll calm down a little. It's kind of self-comforting. It comes back here, looks at her but there's no smile. There you see him drool. And this is a baby who wasn't drooling before. Didn't have any of signs of even losing a little uh, bodily control. He starts tonguing, another sign of being upset. And now he's hiccuping. And his whole body, if you will, is getting, to some extent, unregulated. If this response occurs in the laboratory, what happens when infants are emotionally deprived over long periods of time? Tronic discovered similar kinds of behavior in the babies of chronically depressed mothers. The infants of depressed mothers have been experiencing this kind of interaction on a regular basis and develop a pattern of being disengaged from the mothers. Tronic's findings about the role of strong emotional ties in the life of the baby echo the research of psychiatrist René Spitz in the 1940s. Capturing a much more extreme situation, Spitz filmed infants who were institutionalized when their mothers were jailed. Many of the children he studied became apathetic, cried continuously, and lost weight. Their natural resistance was lowered, and some died. Dr. Robert Emdy, an infant researcher at the University of Colorado Medical School, was a student of Spitz. Renee Spitz 
really shocked the world with very painful, dramatic pictures of children who looked so painfully sad and devastated. And although their physical needs were being attended to, they lacked the emotional availability of caregivers. These infants looked horrifically sad in a strict analogy to grief in an older child or adult. Infants also can be grieved. And people couldn't bear to look at those films. It's very hard to look at them today. Some of the extreme situations may look very unusual and abnormal, and you might say, well, that doesn't exist today. Unfortunately, these awful, pained, emotionally starved expressions are seen today. There is an epidemic of child abuse and neglect, and it's a very serious problem. And in fact, when we see this expression, we teach clinicians to uh, explore further because intervention uh, is, uh, and help uh, needs to be on the way. These films presented persuasive evidence that a strong tie with a caring adult is crucial to the infant's emotional and physical well-being. They had an extraordinary impact on the study of infant emotions and the treatment of emotional disorders. Hi, sweetheart. How are you doing? Hi, I'm Dr. Greenspan. Hi. Dr. Stanley Greenspan, a psychiatrist with the Public Health Service, is on the firing line daily. He works with disturbed children, like those in the Spitz footage, and with more common childhood problems. His starting point is an appreciation of individual patterns of emotional development. Each baby will experience sound, touch, visual experiences, their own movement patterns quite differently. And as a baby progresses up his own match or her own maturation ladder and through the emotional milestones, they organize experience differently based on what they're blessed with when they come into the world. But it's very, very important for parents to have tools to help the baby master their new emotional milestones. A pioneer of early intervention, Greenspan believes emotional problems can be treated in babies as young as two months. This mother is concerned about her son's fussiness. In the past, treatment would have focused mainly on the parent's role. Greenspan's team pays equal attention to what the child brings to the relationship. Watch my rain. Watch my rain. Here, at the Maryland Regional Center for Infants, they look for areas where a baby may be overly sensitive to sights, sounds, or touch. These may interfere with his critical ability to calm down and explore the world. This sensory evaluation, for example, tests this baby's tolerance for different kinds of movement. Upside down. Upside down. Good boy. During the workup, the team confirms what the mother has suspected. He is especially sensitive to touch. His arched back indicates that he finds pressure there unbearable. A baby's aversion to touch could make a mother feel rejected and set the stage for future emotional problems. Here's your tummy, Jason. Here's your tummy. Were you discouraged initially? Were you? It was clear to me that I wasn't getting the the real cuddly um, right. baby that I you know I always sort of dreamed I would have a, a baby that I would be you know have sleeping on my belly and, and yeah. carrying around in a snuggly and this and right. that. Um, you know, it was clear that he wasn't that kind of baby. It was on the other hand sort of exciting that he was so interested in in things. He was, all, he was so he alert, right. alert from, from the time he was born. Right. Helps with him how sure. you do at home. Sure. The team's strategy is to help this mother adjust her parenting style to reflect the special care her child requires. <laughs> On the other cheek, yes I am, yes I am. Got you. I think that with babies who don't like a lot of touch, if you can make it be a game, like the kissing, then they can really enjoy it and not know that they're getting touched. So that's the way to sneak it we'll in sneak on it. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Is this unusual? Yes. Use that alertness and interest by giving him visual and auditory support. 
when you're holding him in the position like you're doing now and you gently put your hand on his back, allows him to begin using his strength, which is his great attentiveness, his great interest in things. His first laugh was when I was doing that. Yeah. Oh, he loves that. He loves that. In this case, early recognition of a child's special constitutional needs has helped maintain the critical dance between mother and child. But other types of problems demand a different approach. We have a comprehensive model where we pay equal respect to what the baby brings into the world and how the baby uh, matures, what the parents bring in in terms of their character structure, their past history. We also pay attention to the larger cultural context that the family operates in. Remember, she's just little. David. <laughs> That wasn't nice. This mother is worried about how to handle the developing rivalry between her son and daughter. He'll get a running start from across the room and right in her face. He'll just push as hard as he can. And then the next minute, he'll turn around and kiss her. He's just very changeable with it. I'm afraid, I guess the worst problem is I'm afraid he's going to hurt her, not intentionally, but. Like if she'll crawl, he'll try and get on her and just sit down on her, and I'm afraid it's really going to hurt her one day. Greenspan believes some families need help, even with common problems such as sibling rivalry. It's his conviction that early intervention can head off more serious problems later on. This little baby girl, she has a big brother, and he turnizes his little sister. And mommy's got to figure out now, how do I balance the needs of my little girl, who's a wonderful, loving little girl, but who's also very, very sensitive and easily gets offended and hurt and upset, and the needs of my assertive big boy. And if this continued, brother might feel that the way to deal with having to share mommy is to beat up the kid who's less strong than me. And this little girl could be scared of the world generally. Greenspan's goal in therapy is to find positive ways to get a family back on track so he proposes techniques to alter the way family members relate to one another. David is going to be a giver and a helper, a, a mommy's partner. Come take these rings from Heather and see if she'll come back and get them. You take those. No, I'm Hold them out to her. Hold them out and see if she'll come get them. See. Here, Heather. Yeah, Heather. Until recently, yeah. most therapists would have considered this kind of early intervention strictly experimental. Children were not usually treated until more obvious problems emerged, such as extremes of destructive behavior. Even today, this comprehensive approach is available in only a handful of clinics across the country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. She got him back. Yeah, we got Very him good. Back. Now we're cooking, huh? By working with him, he'll get to do that, and also. At the same time, it'll, you'll be helping him learn to share more with Heather. You'll be helping Heather learn to be more assertive. And he'll feel good because he'll be a partner to you. Can I get a shake? Thanks. Are you going to be a, a partner now? The question comes down to, does intervention really work when you study babies? Can family patterns be changed so that the family and the baby can negotiate their own emotional growth together? In our clinical experience is yes. Looking at all studies ever done, preventive intervention approaches for a variety of problems tend to work. What the studies did not answer is how long will these interventions last once they stop? And that's future challenges. So we have many refined questions to pursue, but I think we're building on a very, very strong foundation. A firm foundation for early intervention, however, isn't built on clinical experience alone. It also depends on a solid theoretical foundation based on the steps science has taken towards understanding emotions. It's easy to see why emotional development has always presented a problem for science, particularly in young children who are not yet able to talk. After all, what is an emotion? To most of us, it's simply a sensation we call a feeling. But that sort of definition is too elusive for scientists. Other components of emotions, such as physical and behavioral changes, lend themselves more easily to scientific study because they can be observed and measured. So in the past few years, the emphasis has been on developing new research techniques that are both objective and useful in exploring the inner world of children. 
And what has come out of this work is a view of emotions as an intrinsic part of our biological heritage. Unraveling the mysteries of emotions has been the life work of Professor Carol Izzard at the University of Delaware. A very interested expression, very attentive, okay. But, uh, Izzard believes that facial expressions are a window into emotions. He studies small children to capture their expressions before they learn to hide their feelings. How are you? Huh? Are you okay today? Would you say hello to me? Are you all right? Oh, you look like a real cute girl to me. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you do. The response we see here in, uh, uh, in Ashley as I approached her and, and, uh, and uh, tried to strike a little conversation, just a nice, normal, shy response is so frequently observed in children that we think that it has something to do with caution built into the youngster that keeps them from becoming too quickly involved with a stranger. <laughs> Izzard's research grew out of observations made by Charles Darwin, which were ignored for almost a century. Charles Darwin, in 1872, published a landmark volume in which he uh, presented the theoretical notions as well as a, a considerable amount of interesting empirical data showing that there were some emotions that were innate and universal. Darwin theorized that these innate emotions are linked to specific facial expressions, which evolved as a means for the helpless infant to communicate its needs. Izard set out to see if Darwin was right. He was looking for a group of facial expressions that communicate the same feelings to people everywhere. One logical candidate was distress, so he went to clinics to study how babies react to pain. In these early immunizations, you're likely to see mainly the physical distress response, which is the all-out emergency cry for help. Come change what's happening. Yes, I know. Ready? All stick. Okay. <laughs> this child had the typical physical distress reaction, uh, showing the tightly closed eyes and the sort of a squarish, angular mouth. It's a peremptory signal. It just commands attention on the part of caregivers. Izard studied hundreds of babies, and they all reacted to pain with the same facial pattern. This evidence convinced him that distress is a universal, innate emotional expression essential to survival. He wondered what other emotions might be part of the inborn human repertoire. To find out, Izard and his colleagues made use of a group of innovative experiments to provoke infants into showing their feelings. Hi, baby. Oh, Hi. Is everybody ready? Now we're going to try to attract Sheena's attention up toward the black curtain, and we're ready to go. This is infant of about seven months of age is in what we call our little baby uh, infant theater. A uh, three-dimensional mask will be brought up for the baby to see. These unusual masks stimulate children to display a variety of facial expressions that are recorded on videotape for frame-by-frame -frame analysis. Now here the baby sees an eyeless face. The baby lifts the brows, greeting this uh, object, and shows intense interest. Interest was another of the fundamental expressions Izard was able to uncover. But identifying these expressions was just the first step. My early work as a clinical psychologist led me to the conclusion that virtually all human problems involved emotions. But in, the, in those days, in the 1950s, there was very little ob objective or scientific information about the emotions of human experience. Scientists had not studied emotions because of the need for objectivity. To satisfy this need, Izard developed a coding system that researchers everywhere could use to classify facial expressions. His coding system divides the face into three regions corresponding to the nerves and muscle groups that control expression. The neutral face, showing no emotions, is the starting point. When the brows are obliquely raised and drawn together, the eyes slightly squinted, and the corners of the mouth pulled down, 
the combination equals sadness. We think that this expression on the face of the infant, even in the first half year of life, is matched internally by a motivational state on the part of the infant. This is a sad feeling that accompanies this expression. The buildup of another expression begins again with the neutral face. First, a squarish angular mouth is added. Then the eyes are slightly squinted and staring. And the brow is arched in an expression that is easily recognized as anger. Izard believes that there is an innate timetable for the emergence of emotional expression. At birth, a child reacts to pain and discomfort with distress. The expression of anger emerges later and is linked to the child's ability to perform aggressive or defensive actions. Izard has encoded seven facial expressions that researchers all over the world now use. He believes that these expressions represent a set of fundamental human emotions that are innate and universal. We think these emotions are serving important biological and social functions in the establishing of the first social bond and in the development of the ultimate personality in each individual. We have excellent data to show that facial expression is not just skin deep. When uh, the infant shows an interest expression, we have a heart rate deceleration. We have changes in the autonomic nervous system. And when the child looks sad, the child behaves like a sad child. Parents see a sad infant or a sad child, and they try to change the sad expression. But if they change the sad expression on the child's face to a happy one, they are also controlling the patterns and flow of emotional experiences that make up the child's emotional life. In addition to facial expressions, what other aspects of emotional behavior might be influenced by inborn tendencies? When Professor Jerome Kagan at Harvard University began his studies, he, like most of his colleagues, believed that all differences in behavior among children were caused by environmental factors. But new observations changed his focus. In 1969 and 70, we were studying some children in the South End of Boston, and we saw that some children were just very, very cautious, whether they were raised in a daycare center or at home. And now I was <laughs> more perceptive. And the zeitgeist had changed. And I realized that maybe this was a temperamental quality. And so we began the research that we've been doing for the last uh, six or seven years. Three children and their mothers enter a room full of enticing toys. Kagan and his associate Steve Resnick and Jane Gibbons watch on a TV monitor. They're looking for differences in behavior among these two-year-olds. Some children seem comfortable in this situation, while others are more timid. The uh, cautious child is just standing there studying the other children. She's not close to her mother, but she is uh, fixed and just watching what's happening. She is the only child who's not yet touched a toy in this playroom. The other two have explored things and manipulated things. She is still staring. So you'll know the very important difference. The cautious child is staring at the other. Well, you'll see uh, our child with the drum is not. And moments ago, we saw the child at the sink who was preoccupied with her own work. Because it's typical that these cautious children will be casing the place and studying the other children. These children were tested eight months earlier. The results were the same. This little girl was as timid then as she is now. In other studies of timid and bold children, Kagan has found variations in heart rate and hormone levels. Such results have led him to conclude that the differences he's observed are in fact an outward manifestation of inborn temperament. Our general uh, 
view is this, that a small proportion of children, we think maybe 10 to 15 percent, but no more, are born with a slight push from nature to be either very outgoing, the way that child with the drum is, or with a slight bias to be fearful, vigilant, apprehensive, cautious. Although there are other temperamental variables, it just could be that we stumbled on this so easily and found such robust uh, evidence because it might be that this is the most salient temperamental quality in mammals. That's just a possibility. Kagan has followed some children for years and has found that many of them maintain their timid and bold behavior well into their school years. He has come to see these temperamental qualities as biologically determined. But what does this mean to parents? There are parents, a small group, who have a very cautious child, one of the type that we think is biologically influenced. And they believe that they did something to the child to make this child so cautious, shy, and vigilant. In this case, when they realize that, no, their child began life with this disposition, that knowledge is very reassuring and, in many cases, reduces some guilt or, or sense of responsibility. We know from our work with parents that many parents believe that a cautious child is somewhat at risk. But if this is a child with this biological surface, the parents may be better off re-examining their bias against the cautious children and thinking through, how do I learn to live with a cautious child? How does my child learn to handle his or her caution? I, I think that's an important message that comes out of our work. But on the other hand, uh, none of us believes parents should be fatalists. That is to say, we have many cases of parents who nature gave them a cautious child and through gentle handling, the introduction of their child to other peers, a gentle persuasion of their child to try to conquer their apprehensions, we have seen these children change. Uh, and therefore, there's no need to say, there's nothing I can do uh, just because their child happened to begin life with a slight push in this direction. Wow. Yeah. This line of research does not imply that biology is destiny as a look at the accomplishments of children of school age and beyond confirms. It's important to point out that the children who have this cautious profile are not necessarily smarter or dumber, more or less creative. There is no doubt that the two groups are equal in intelligence and we suspect will be equal in their grade profile in both elementary and high school and college. So there's no fundamental difference in intellectual ability or abilities between the two groups. The evidence is growing that not only timidity and boldness, but also mood, activity level, and emotional intensity are all biologically influenced and provide a strong inborn basis for personality development. In Denver, professors Joseph Campos and Robert M.D. are also probing the relationship between biological factors and environmental influences in the development of early emotions. The apparatus is called a visual cliff. One side of a plexiglass sheet is painted. The other side is transparent, creating the illusion of a big drop. Researchers have been working with the cliff to explore whether parents by facial expression alone can change the behavior of their children. Joseph Campos began by trying to determine if one type of fear, namely fear of heights, is innate. With the underneath illumination, the child cannot see any reflection of himself. The glass surface is invisible. Come here. Cameron. <gasps> Look. Look. Come here. He doesn't seem to show any facial expressions of fear. Come on. Come here, look. Oh, what a good boy you are. Here he comes. Come on. Woo. Come here. In this baby, as you can see, he shows very little wariness of heights as he crosses the deep side of the cliff to his father. Boy. As with more than 300 other babies that Campos has tested, 
This infant, who has just begun to crawl, crosses unafraid over the drop, suggesting that fear of heights is not innate, at least in children of this age. What a good baby. What a good boy you are. Katie. But after a child has been crawling for about a month, a change occurs. Katie, what are you doing? You can crawl. Come here. This baby, called by her mother, would like to cross over, but she can't seem to make herself do it. A fear of heights has developed. Campos speculates that a biological switch is thrown after the child starts crawling. Until then, the child does not show any fear of heights. The typical baby from eight and a half months of age on won't cross that if you give him a million bucks. That's the same for animals. You can, kittens, dogs. Um, the only exception to the rule is turtles who think that it's a swimming pool and they kind of prepare to jump into the water and get a surprise when their, um, their shell hits the hard surface of the glass. <laughs> so when the child first begins to crawl, it exhibits no fear of heights. Yet a month later, the same child clearly acts afraid. The experimenters wondered, how does the fear develop? Another experiment was suggested by Dr. Mary Klinert. The purpose of the experiment is to put the baby in an ambiguous situation um, where they don't quite know whether they dare go down this much depth or not. And Since no accomplished crawler would cross the deep drop, she raised the bottom so that the drop appears to the infant only about a step high. The question is, can the baby be influenced to cross or not solely by the parent's expression? What happens is they start out across and they get to kind of, there's kind of a white border and as they get closer... Klinner teaches border, a mother to put on a fear face thing. by suggesting components so from Izard's coded expressions. And then he looks up at you. That's when we want you to look scared. Imagine being just horrified. You, he's coming to the end, edge of a cliff and he's going to drop. You up as far as you can get him. Now, can you open your eyes a little bit wider? Okay, good. Now, can can you get the mouth a little bit? Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Typically, in this situation, the baby will check with her facial expression, and then what we do is have the mom either smile, in which case the babies tend to go across or look afraid, and that affects the babies and they stay back. The baby looks at the drop, then checks with his mother. The baby drops down and backs away. So even when the drop is shallow, the baby won't cross when warned off by his mother's facial expression. Now, what will happen if the mother smiles? Once she smiled, he picked up on that and was trying to come across. He, he turned around and started treating this like a step but he was definitely trying, and his behavior changed when she smiled and let him know it was okay. There are a variety of situations that babies want to understand rules about what's okay or not. Um, certainly after 12 months of age, this is the case. In fact, from our studies in the home, there's reason to believe that it happens more often with the voice than with the face, with mom in another part of the room or possibly even in another room, and indicating to the child uh, her emotional evaluation uh, about a certain situation. We think one of the most important mechanisms for emotional development involves the child's catching fears from the parent. So that if the child is approaching the edge of a staircase and the mother notices the child, she swoops down and says, Johnny, you're about to fall. The baby's in a position to learn not through hard knocks, as it were, but through the vicarious experience created by the mother's affect that this is a dangerous situation. 
What these experiments seem to show is that in the development of fear of heights, there is a definite biological mechanism at work, but one that is strongly influenced by emotional messages from the caregivers. As the baby grows older and develops intellectually, the social influences on emotional development increase. At about 18 months, a new set of emotions emerges. Embarrassment, shame, guilt, sympathy, and pride. These emotions help the child function in society. But how and why do these emotions arise? According to one line of research, they appear only after children recognize themselves as individuals. Dr. Michael Lewis of Rutgers University Medical School studies the social emotions. He has devised a very simple experiment that identifies a watershed in the development of the child's sensibilities. A spot of rouge is put on this 16-month-old boy's nose, and he is placed before a mirror. Beep, beep. Come on. Lala, Jordan says, but that's his sister's name. Who is that? Jordan, who is that? Lala. He doesn't seem to recognize himself, and there is no sign of embarrassment. The embarrassed expression is a sort of a looking, smiling, and then gaze apart, and then looking back. Uh, he did not show this embarrassed uh, expression in the mirror. In fact, we would not have expected him to do so because he was not able to recognize himself in the mirror. Bobby is just two months older, an age at which he may have passed a crucial milestone, the development of a sense of self. The experimenters place Bobby before the mirror, but it's unclear whether or not he recognizes himself. Continuing with the experiment, they put rouge on his nose. If he has developed a sense of self and a standard about how he ought to look, he will show it with an unmistakable expression. And the way we can tell the child recognizes itself is to see whether or not the child touches its finger to its nose. Over here. Notice that after recognizing himself, smiles, turns his head down, and avoids looking in the mirror. Those behaviors reflect the emotion of embarrassment. By the advent of a sense of self, the child now possesses the tools to add what we call the social emotions to its repertoire. It is these emotions which uh, allow the child commerce with its social environment. The child now can feel guilty or ashamed of transgressing a rule. The child can feel empathetic to another's distress. And the child can feel pride at succeeding in others' rules. With the addition of the social emotions, the child is well on the way to acquiring the basic tools of emotional life. But new feelings continue to develop as the child draws closer to others with emotions of sympathy and empathy, which can be seen as the rudiments of morality. At the National Institute of Mental Health, Dr. Marion Yarrow and Dr. Carolyn Waxler believe that children can show early indications of sympathy and empathy even as newborns. They observe mothers and children in experimental situations to find out how these civilizing emotions develop. I think there were many uh, motivations for beginning this research in the 1970s. At that time, there was a lot of interest in moral development of children or in conscience, but much of the emphasis was on the guilt that the child had or the transgressions that the child got into. And very little attention was being paid then to the kind of positive, outgoing behavior of very young children. <coughs> These poor people got hurt really badly. It's really sad. In this experimental situation with a two-year-old boy, 
a stranger pretends to be upset by pictures in a magazine. <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> somebody wasn't very nice to him. A child of this age, concerned at another's distress, yet not knowing how to help, will often try to get its mother to intervene. In taking action to help another person, Jeffrey shows he has reached an important stage in emotional development. Yarrow and Waxler try to identify the factors that bring out this caring behavior. We're very much concerned about, is the child empathic? Is the child sympathetic? And uh, what kinds of actions follow from those feelings? Are they interpreting the other person's feelings and then reacting in terms of those feelings. In a follow-up experiment, Jeffrey's mother will pretend to be hurt. The researchers want to know how the child will react. Jeffrey reacts with mixed emotions to his mother's distress, and that's not unusual for a child of this age. When a child is confronted with some kind of distress, yes, they may show an empathic response, but yes, they may show some anger and aggression as well. Distress is a very complex stimulus for a child, and it elicits similar kind of complexity in the child. This ambiguous reaction presents the experimenters with a puzzling question. How does a child eventually choose between aggressive and empathic behavior? As it happens, somewhat later, the mother accidentally hurts her child. This time, the message to the scientists is clear. Her empathic caregiving seems to come out so clearly when her child experiences distress. Mm -hmm. And in some of our earlier studies, there were sort of several different aspects of mothering that seemed to be particularly related to sort of high levels of empathy in children. And that was one of them, the mother's empathic caregiving of her own child was more likely to produce a child who was very empathic to other people in distress. So the emotions of sympathy and empathy, which begin as confused, often inappropriate responses to distress, can gain focus from the interaction between parent and child. Again, we see the inextricable influences of upbringing and inborn tendencies. As researchers round out the picture of childhood emotions, they have begun to attempt a synthesis, a theory of how emotional development progresses. Scientists have long recognized distinct stages in physical and intellectual growth, but only recently have researchers and clinicians like Stanley Greenspan attempted to lay out the stages of emotional development. We now know the series of emotional stages, the feelings a child goes through from infancy up through three or four that determine how well they establish these fundamental personality characteristics, characteristics that are essential for healthy childhood and adult functioning. Zero to two months, a child is learning to calm down and relax. This is the process known as self-regulation, an essential step that allows the infant to take in and make sense of the outside world. It's the first of what Greenspan sees as a six-stage process. As the baby moves beyond its second month, it enters a stage that Greenspan calls falling in love. Mommy gets Lisa to give her a big smile. Come on, Lisa. Smile. Come on. Oh, look at that. Beautiful expression. Lisa is at stage two, falling in love. Okay. 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 Ok
In stage two, children begin to form crucial ties with important people in their world. In the third stage, which starts at around four months, the baby begins purposeful communication. By four to eight months, the child is going beyond feeling secure and falling in love and now learning how to have an emotional dialogue, learning how to communicate intentionally. This is the beginning of knowing that the world is an orderly place. It's the baby version of reality testing, knowing that when they smile, a smile comes back. When they talk, some sounds come back. When they reach out, some reaching out comes back to them. Ooh, that's your hand. The senses contribute both to falling in love and communication. Ooh. The baby senses as part of their emotional development, because if a baby enjoys touch, obviously it's that much easier for them to fall in love with the world. They then learn to use that love as a way to begin communicating with the world. That's the stage she's at now, which is having impact, communicating with a world that she's already fallen in love with. In the third stage, a child becomes aware that her smile makes people happy. Her sadness brings comforting from adults. Trust and confidence develop. In stage four, children satisfy their emotional needs by more complex interactions with people and objects. By 10, 12 months to 18 months, a complex sense of self is forming as a child is stringing together these little units of interaction into more orchestrated patterns. So the child takes mother's hands and walks into the refrigerator and points to the food they want. That's a purposeful, organized little self expressing its needs and desires. In their enjoyment of games and toys, children just under a year show their capacity for initiative, independence, and purpose. But in the next stage, the child makes a creative and intellectual leap. And then by 18 to 24 months, we see a marvelous transformation. This organized sense of self now gets organized at a higher level, what we call the creation of emotional ideas and the beginning of emotional thinking. In the fifth stage, children can create an image of loved ones, mother and father, for example, in their mind's eye. They can do the same for favorite toys. This means that make-believe is possible, with children acting out their own and other people's feelings, setting the stage for genuine understanding of how the world works. And then between about 24 to 30 months and up through 48 months, we see these emotional symbols or ideas coalescing into organized units. Now we have a higher level sense of self and a higher level sense of the other in one's own mind, so to speak. Mastery of these skills is reflected in a three-year-old's elaborate games of fantasy. We're going to have the longer for lunch. All right, that sounds good. Baby. See how organized the pretend is. It's not just a little tea party lasting two seconds. It's an organized tea party, with starting out with beans and lunch, and then tea is the final uh, course. Now, what does this mean in terms of the child's mental health? When they can do this, it sets a basis for being able to figure out how the world works. Baby, they can begin anticipating, if I do this, baby. it'll mean that. Oh, yeah. If I am nice to my mommy, my mommy might be nice back to me. Oh, there she is, say, mommy. mommy. Yeah. So in short, the basic personality functions that are so critical to healthy adult functioning are all learned for the first time in the first three to three and a half years of life. So, according to Greenspan, the progression works this way. An infant's initial interest in the world, in sights, sounds, and feelings, broadens to become an interest in people that grows into love. Love becomes the need to communicate, to engage in an emotional dialogue that leads the child to interact in ever more elaborate ways, to understand other people, and to understand the world. Greenspan believes his stages can help parents and pediatricians by giving them guidelines to judge whether children are on track emotionally. However, some researchers question whether the field is sufficiently advanced to define these specific emotional stages. Still, most researchers do agree that even very young children have richer emotional lives than ever before imagined. We begin life with a set of survival-oriented emotions. As we acquire social emotions, we become social beings. 
And as childhood progresses, we take on the ever more complicated emotional patterns that define us as human beings. As scientists understand childhood emotions better, we come to understand human nature better. In this sense, the child is parent to us all. Additional funding for this program was provided by the National Science Foundation. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. And by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. and the Johnson & Johnson family of companies supplying health care products worldwide.